Schubert, played by a girl in an exquisite dress, candles and chandeliers sparkling in her hair and eyes. Art. Surface, of course, but art is all surface and symbol at once. Those who go beneath the surface do so at their peril. You remember Basil Hallward, the painter, whose disappearance some years ago caused such public excitement and conjecture? He it was who painted that picture. That notorious picture. The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Dramatised for radio by Nick McCarty. With Jamie Glover as Dorian Gray, and Ian McDermott as Lord Henry Wooten. I was in the habit then of visiting Basil's studio regularly. It was summer, and the studio was filled with the rich odour of roses. When the summer breeze stirred the trees of the garden, there came through the open door the heavy scent of lilac or the delicate perfume of the pink flowering thorn. Well, Henry, what do you think of it? I was lying on the divan of Persian saddlebags, smoking an opium-tinted cigarette and watching the play of light through the long tussaw silk curtains that were stretched in front of the large window. The dim roar of London was like the burden note of a distant organ. Well? It is quite the best thing you have done. I believe it is. Who is the young man? A model? No, no. He is quite beautiful. You have captured more than a likeness. You must send it next year to the Grosvenor. <laughs> Why not the Academy? The Academy is too large and vulgar. Whenever I go there, there have been either so many people that I've not been able to see the pictures, which was dreadful, or so many pictures that I've not been able to see the people, which was worse. I won't send it anywhere. What odd chaps you painters are. You do anything to gain a reputation. As soon as you have one, you seem to want to throw it away. It's silly of you, for there is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. I know you'll laugh at me, but I really can't exhibit it. I've put too much of myself into it. <laughs> I knew you would laugh. It's true, all the same. I didn't know you were so vain, Basil. I see very little of you in this. He is a Narcissus, and you, you have an intellectual expression, <laughs> but beauty, real beauty, ends where an intellectual expression begins. Don't flatter yourself, Basil, you're not in the least like him. Oh, I should be sorry to look like him. The ugly and the stupid have it best in this world. If they know nothing of victory, they're spared the knowledge of defeat. What do you know of defeat? Your rank and wealth, and my brains, and my art, whatever they may be worth. Dorian Gray's good looks. We shall all suffer for what the gods have given us. Dorian Gray. Is that his name? I didn't intend to tell you his name. When I like people immensely, I never tell their names to anyone. It's like surrendering a part of them. When I leave town, I never tell my people. I've grown to love secrecy. Is that foolish? You forget I'm married. And the one charm of marriage is that it makes a life of deception absolutely necessary for both parties. When we meet, my wife and I, we tell each other the most absurd stories with the most serious faces. My wife is so much better than I am, she never gets confused over the dates, and I always do. I believe you're a much better husband than you pretend to be. <laughs> you never say a moral thing, and you never do a wrong thing. Your cynicism is a pose. Being natural is a pose, the most irritating I know. <laughs> tell me truly why you refuse to exhibit his portrait. It's... It's hard for me to say. It, it sounds so incredible. Then I should believe you at once. I think... Well, two months ago, I was at a crush at Lady Brandon's. You know how artists have to remind the public from time to time that we're not savages. That's where I saw him, at Lady Brandon's. A peacock in everything but beauty. She insisted we met. She treats guests as an auctioneer treats his goods. The poor woman so wanted to find a salon, and she only succeeded in opening a restaurant. Harry, you have no idea of friendship. Unjust. I choose my friends for their good looks, my acquaintances for their good characters, and my enemies for their good intellects. 
A man cannot be too careful in the choice of his enemies. So I must be merely an acquaintance. Much more. Oof, less than a friend. A sort of brother. I don't care for brothers. My elder brother won't die, and my younger brother seem to do nothing else. <laughs> Harry, I don't believe a single word. Tell me more about Dorian Gray. How often do you see him? I couldn't be happy if I didn't see him every day. Extraordinary. I never thought you'd care for anything but your art. He is all my art to me now. I can recreate life in a way that was hidden from me before, if he sits beside me. I must meet Dorian Gray. I insist. Harry, I, I find in him all the loveliness and subtleties of colour and line. <laughs> I cannot exhibit his portrait because I have put into it some expression of this idolatry. Idolatry? There is too much of myself in it. I cannot bear my soul to the world's eyes. I cannot. Is Dorian Gray fond of you? Why should he visit me if he were not? Come, Basil. Days in summer are apt to linger. There will come a day when you will be perfectly cold and indifferent when he calls, or he will be cold and indifferent to you. He likes me, I know. But sometimes he seems to take delight in giving me pain, as if my soul were a flower to put in his coat, an ornament for a summer's day. I want to meet him. I don't want you to. Mr. Dorian Gray, sir. Are you at home? Fate, Basil. So gloriously predictable. We are both at home, Parker. Dorian Gray is my dearest friend. He has a simple and beautiful nature. Don't spoil him. Don't influence him. The world has many marvellous people in it. Don't take away from me the one person who gives my heart whatever charm it possesses. Basil. Oh, beg your pardon. I didn't know you had anyone with you. Mr. Gray. Dorian Gray. Lord Henry Wotton. He was all his portrait promised. And it was plain to see that poor Basil already bored him. Let me the music, Basil. I want to learn it. That depends on how you sit today, Dorian. You see, my lord, how easily I get into people's bad books. Not only Basil here, but Lady Agatha's too. I'll make your peace with my aunt. She is quite devoted to you. She has told me so. I promised to go to a club in Whitechapel with her last Tuesday and quite forgot. We were to play a duet together. Three duets. It won't have mattered. When Aunt Agatha sits down to the piano, she makes quite enough noise for two. <laughs> That is very horrid to her, and not very nice to me. You're too charming to go in for philanthropy, Mr. Gray. Far too charming. Will you smoke? Harry, I want to finish this picture today. Would you think it rude of me to ask you to go away? Am I to go, Mr. Gray? Please don't. Basil is in one of his sulky moods, and I can't bear him then. If Lord Henry goes, then I shall go too. It is horribly dull standing on a platform trying to look pleasant. Basil, you've often told me that you like sitters to have someone to chat to. Since Dorian wishes it, of course you must stay. And remember that Lord Henry has a bad influence over all his friends. All his friends, Basil? The single exception of myself. <laughs> is that true, Lord Henry? Are you a bad influence? There is no such thing as a good influence. Fear, shame, terror. These are the forces that drive mankind. The terror of society is the basis of morals. And the terror of God is the secret of religion. It is in the brain only that the great sins of the world take place. You, Mr. Gray, with your rose-red youth and your rose-white boyhood, have had passions that made you afraid, thoughts that have filled you with terror and shame. You bewilder me. Turn your head to the right a little, like a good boy. 
He stood with a small move of impatience as Basil painted away with that bold touch of his. As Basil worked, we talked, or rather I talked and the young man listened. His finely chiseled nostrils and the rebellious curls tangled in gilded shreds. Basil, I need a rest. A drink. Excuse me. I've nearly done. Parker will have put drinks in the garden. I'll finish the detail and you may come and see the finished work in a few minutes. You must not sit in the sunshine, Mr. Gray. The sunburn would be quite unbecoming. What can it matter? It should matter everything to you. You have the most marvellous youth, and youth is the one thing worth having. I don't feel that, Lord Henry. When you're old and wrinkled and ugly, when thought has seared your forehead with its hideous lines and passion branded your lips with hideous fires, you will feel it then, terribly. Beauty is a form of genius. It cannot be questioned. It makes princes of those who have it, as you do. My lord, listen to me. Time is already jealous of you and will wage war on that youth. You will become sallow and hollow-cheeked and dull-eyed. You will suffer horribly. Don't squander youth. It never returns. Our limbs fail, our senses rot. We degenerate into hideous puppets haunted by the memory of the passions of which we were too much afraid and the exquisite temptations to which we had not the courage to yield. Bring your drinks. Come, see the finished portrait. I watched the young man as he gazed at the shadow of his own loveliness and knew that one day what I said would become true. Time would claim him. He would wrinkle, grow dull, and be broken and deformed by age. Don't you like it? Of course he likes it. It's one of the greatest paintings in the history of modern art. I'll give you anything you like for it. I must have it. It is not my property, Harry. Historians. How sad it is. How sad. I shall grow old and horrible, but this picture will remain forever young. If only it were the other way around. I should object most strongly to that. I believe, Basil, you like your art better than your friends. How long will you like me? Until my first wrinkle? Well, Lord Henry is right. Youth is the only thing worth having. When I find that I am growing old, I shall kill myself. You mustn't talk like that. I shall never have such a friend as you. I am jealous of everything whose beauty does not die. I am jealous of the portrait you have painted. Every moment that passes takes something from me and gives it to that portrait. Why did you paint it? One day it will mock me horribly. I hate it. This is it your doing, Harry? It is the real Dorian Gray. I'll destroy it. I'm not let a picture come between me and my two best friends. I'll cut it to ribbons now. Find the palette knife. No, no, you shan't. That would be... That would be murder. The picture is a part of myself. I feel it. There is nothing, nothing in the world that I would not give to remain as I am and for the picture to grow old. I would give my soul for that. Enough. Come with me to the theatre. Both of you. <laughs> a splendid notion. You promised you'd stay and play the Schubert. I can't. I'm going to the theatre with Lord Henry. As you wish. Goodbye, Harry. Goodbye, Dorian. Come and see me soon. Certainly. You won't forget. The portrait will be varnished then and ready for you. I won't forget. And Harry, remember what I asked you this morning. I have forgotten it. I trust you. <laughs> I wish I could trust myself. Come, Mr. Gray, my handsome is outside. The next morning, I went to see my uncle at the Albany. He would know the pedigree and family of the boy. Lord Fermor sat as usual in a chair by the fire. Rough tweeds, on as rough-mannered an old bachelor as ever graced the Albany. Passed over for the embassy in Paris for which he was supremely well suited by birth, by indolence and his passion for pleasure, after which he never did another day's work. 
Money, is it, Harry? It's the usual reason you young dandies come to see their relatives. So damned early, too. Thought you were never abroad till five. Not money, Uncle George. It's only people who pay their bills who need money. Gray. Dorian Gray. You know his family? Gray. Grandson of Kelso. Son of... Ah, my word, my dear boy. Son of Margaret Deverux, who made such a damn fool of herself running off with a penniless subaltern in some foot regiment. Beautiful as she was willful. Proud girl. Ugly story. Tell it. Father sent a man, it was said. Some Belgian brute of an adventurer to insult his new son-in-law. And did more than insult him. Spitted him like a partridge. Hushed up, of course, but Kelso ate his chop alone for a long time after that. Very long time. The child was the soldier's. Of course. Is he good-looking? Moderately. If I'm any judge, he'd be more than moderately good-looking, Harry. And more than moderately well off. Not of age yet, is he? Mm. No, can't be. His mother was a wonderful woman. Could have had any man she wanted. Carrington went on his knees to her and she laughed in his face. <laughs> Spirit, you see. Kelso brought her and the child home from Spa and took her to the country. They say she never spoke to him again. Not one word. <laughs> wonderful girl. Spirited. Don't find him like that any longer. All Americans and meat packers' daughters, <laughs> not stairs. Curious that behind everything of beauty that has ever existed lies some tragedy. A vase, a building, a woman. Yet the very fact made Dorian even more perfect. How sad that he too would fade. Even my dear Aunt Agatha would understand how sad that is. Sadder even than her dreary luncheons. Aunt! Ah, oh. Late as usual, Henry. He refused to wait. I think you know most of my guests. I do, I do. Lady Harley, how charming your son looked at the ball last night. <laughs> Sir Thomas, what is it like to find you here? Hello. Mrs. Vandalore, how are you? Quite Henry. recovered, I hope. Oh, thank you so much. Lord yes. Fordle, did I hear you speak in the house, or did I dream it? <laughs> Dorian, what a pleasure to see you again so soon. Dorian, you never told me you knew my nephew. I'm quite angry. Don't be. Dorian and I met briefly at a very disreputable painter's studio. Now stop <laughs> showing off Henry and sit. <laughs> Tell us what you know about Dartmoor and his American heiress. I believe she has quite made up her mind to propose to him, aunt. Oh, oh, <laughs> Someone should interfere. I'm told on excellent authority that her father keeps an American dry goods oh. store. <laughs> well, my uncle suggests he may be a pork packer. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly are American dry goods? American novels. Henry, <laughs> Take no notice of him, Mrs. Vandalore. He never means anything, he says. I'm they say good Americans go to Paris when they die. Where do the bad ones go? Mm. America? <laughs> <laughs> he intrigued me, sitting there so watchful, smiling a little, glancing across the table from time to time, and occasionally crossing swords. I couldn't possibly agree with that. Oh, indeed. Orion. I can stand brute force, but brute reason is quite unbearable. It's unfair, hitting below the intellect. <laughs> <laughs> I am vexed with you, Harry, for trying to persuade Dorian not to play in Whitechapel. They won't miss him, aunt. His friends will. Anyway, the less said about the dark side of life, the better. The problem of the East End is very important. And quite so. It is the problem of slavery, and we try to solve it by abusing the slaves. <laughs> <laughs> You are a very naughty boy, Henry. Do you ever see that wife of yours? Often. At her father. <laughs> this conversation is becoming too depressing. Aunt, I must leave you. Dorian, had you forgotten? Supper and before that, a turn in the park. He had promised to meet Basil Hallward, but he walked with me instead. It was the first of many such walks. We met often, at friends, at my club, in my house. Uh, 
Harry, how late you are. I'm afraid it is not Harry, Mr. Gray. I beg your pardon, I thought... You thought it was my husband. The past four weeks, he has rather monopolised you. You see, I know who you are. I know you quite well already by the 17 photographs my husband has. Not 17. 18, then. And I saw you at the opera the other night. Dear Lohengrin, I like Wagner's music better than anybody's. It is so loud, one can talk the whole time without anyone hearing what one says. A great advantage, don't you think? If one hears bad music, it is one's duty to drown it in conversation, Lady Henry. Yes. As Harry says. I always hear Harry's views from his friends. It is the only way I get to know of them. Harry. My love. So sorry I'm late, Dorian. I went to look after a piece of old brocade in Warder Street and had to bargain for hours. Nowadays, people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. <laughs> Dorian. Come, the library. Goodbye, Mr. Gray. Harry, perhaps I shall see you later at Lady Thornbury's? I shouldn't be surprised, my dear. Never marry a woman with straw-coloured hair, Dorian. They are so sentimental. I like sentimental people. Never marry at all. Men marry because they're tired, women because they're curious. Both are disappointed. I'm unlikely to marry. Really? And why is that? I'm too much in love. That is one of your aphorisms, Harry. With whom are you in love? Her name is Sybil Vane. Never heard of her. No one has. They will do. She is a genius. My boy, no woman is a genius. Women represent the triumph of matter over mind, as men represent the triumph of mind over morals. How long have you known your genius? About three weeks. It was your fault. After first meeting you, I was filled with a wild desire to know everything about life. As I lounged in the park or strolled down Piccadilly, I used to watch everyone who passed me with mad curiosity. I had a passion for sensations. I determined to go in search of an adventure. An adventure? One evening, as I wandered into a labyrinth of grimy streets, I passed an absurd little theatre, all flaring gas jets and lurid playbills. And in front of the doors, a hideous man in a gaudy waistcoat and an enormous diamond in the centre of a soiled shirt. Have a box, my lord. Only a guinea to be transported, my lord. Transported by the Bard of Warwick. Only a guinea for a private box, my lord. It be a poison which the friar subtly has ministered to have me dead, lest in this marriage he shall be dishonoured because he married me before to Romeo. It was Romeo and Juliet. Oh, oh, oh. You are not to laugh, Harry. Romeo was a stout gentleman with corked eyebrows and a figure like a beer barrel. Mercutio had friends in the pit. He played them in low comedy. Then, oh, imagine, Harry, a girl, hardly 17 years old, with a little flower-like face, a small Greek head with plaited coils of dark brown hair, eyes dark, velvet, lips like rose petals. Beauty, Harry. Real beauty. And in the pit, they ate oranges and nuts and drank beer, no doubt. <laughs> You're laughing. It's horrid of you. I have seen Sybil dying, sucking the poison from her lover's lips, seen her wandering the forest of Arden, watched her disguised as a pretty boy, seen her mad and innocent. Harry, why didn't you tell me that the only thing worth loving is an actress? Because I have loved so many of them, Dorian. Tell me, what are your actual relations with Sybil Vane? Harry, she is sacred. It is only the sacred things which are worth defiling. <sighs> Why are you annoyed? She will belong to you one day. In love, one begins by deceiving oneself and ends by deceiving others. Methinks I see my cousin's ghost seeking out Romeo that did stick his body upon a rapier's point. Stay! Stay! I went round after the third performance. The manager was determined that I should meet her. I was not entirely sure, yet he persuaded me. 
She was so gentle, so shy. Miss Vane, my lord here wanted to speak to you, my dear. I'm sure I'm grateful, sir. Maybe he'll give you a small token of appreciation of your wonderful performance. Miss Vane, I was truly dazzled by your performance. Sir, you are very kind. I will not call you my lord. You look more like a prince. I must call you Prince Charming. Upon my word, Dorian, Miss Sybil knows how to pay a compliment. You know nothing about it, as she knows nothing of the world. She regards life as another play. She lives with her brother, who is going to find his fortune in Australia. An honest enough boy, I suppose. As is her mother, a faded, sad-eyed woman who, no doubt, has seen better days. Depressing. I have been every night since. And neglect your friends. Dine with me tonight. I can't. She is Imogen tonight, and tomorrow Juliet again. Oh, I worship her. I want you to come and see her act. She must play a West End theatre. I, I will see she does. Bring Basil, if you like. Very well. Juliet, then, tomorrow. Will you see Basil, or shall I write to him? I haven't laid eyes on him for a week. It's rather horrid of me, as he has sent me my portrait in the most wonderful frame. Oh, write to him. I don't want to see him alone. He says things that annoy me. He gives me good advice. And people are fond of giving away what they need most themselves. It's what I call the depth of generosity. He seems to me something of a philistine. Artists, my dear Dorian, exist simply in what they make, and consequently are perfectly uninteresting in what they are. I shall write to him. I went home late that evening. I had sat for much of the time in the window of my club and thought of Dorian, of how the purely sensuous instinct of boyhood becomes changed by imagination. I found a telegram waiting on the hall table. Harry, you shall be the first to know. I am engaged to be married to Sybil Vane. Oh, engaged indeed. Mother, Ma, I'm so happy. Sybil, my dear. You've always told me the only oh, place you were happy was He gives me such a green. feeling of being, oh, I don't know, alive, real. I die for him, Ma. Well, you can just put him out of your mind. You'll have to. I can't. Well, you're I going can't. to have to. Listen to me. Just listen and listen to your brother. Mr. Isaacs has advanced us fifty pounds. Fifty pounds! And got us out of debt. He's been good to now, us. Fifty pounds and he owns me for three years of my life. I won't do it. You Ma. have to do it. For me. For your brother. I'm sorry. I'm ashamed to bring him here. To show him how we live. And if he loves you, what will he care about where you live? You know we owe that money. Jim, tell your sister. Tell her. Oh, she won't listen. The only person she'll listen to is that print-up dandy. Jim! You don't even know his name. I'm not happy about this, Sybil. When Jim's in Australia, there'll just be the two of us. Now you talk of going off. What happens then? The Prince Charming has plenty. He'll be happy to look after you for my sake. Oh, Jim, tell her. Tell her, old bear, to be happy. <laughs> like me. I want everyone to be happy. We know you do, love. I want to talk to you. Come out for a walk, Sybil. I should like that, Jim. Two minutes. Mother, when I've made enough in Australia, I'll be back to pay off Isaacs and get Sybil off the stage, I promise you. I know you will, dear boy. Remember, you chose to do this. I hope the seafaring life will be what you truly want. Look, Ma, we've to been through this already. The chance of mixing in society as a solicitor for going to sea. It's beyond me. I hate offices and I hate clerks. I know what I've chosen. But you see after Sybil, these men going round to talk to her every night. It's not right. Nonsense. It's merely a customer of the theatre. Why to pay a compliment? The young man in question's polite enough. The flowers he sends are lovely. You don't even know his name. Well, he's a gentleman. Well, he looks aristocracy, I must say. Looks, Ma. Appearances, Ma. Illusions. What she deals in every night. It's what you know, not what you think you know. They make a charming couple. 
It's happened before, Jim. If this aristocrat, this gentleman, harms a hair on her head, I shall kill him. I swear to you, Mother, I'll come back, find him out, and kill him. And the gigot of lamb, and before that, quails, and with the lamb champagne. Will that suit, Basil? Indeed it will. Is Dorian coming to dine? I wanted a word before he came. I suppose you've heard the news. Thank you, Jules. Uh, tell the cook we'll want it in half an hour. We're waiting for another guest. If it's politics, I'm not interested. Not a person in the Commons worth painting, save with whitewash. Dorian is engaged to be married. Impossible. <laughs> Impossible? To an actress. It's perfectly true. He's far too sensible, Harry. He's far too wise not to do foolish things now and again. She can hardly marry now and again. Except in America. I didn't say he was married. I said he was engaged. I have a distinct recollection of being married and none at all of being engaged. It's absurd. To marry so much beneath him. If you want to make him marry the girl, tell him so. Whenever a man does a foolish thing, it's always from the noblest motives. She'll be no good for him. She's better than good. She's beautiful. Dorian assures me. He's rarely wrong about such things. Your portrait of him has quickened his appreciation of human beauty. We are to see her tonight. Do you approve, Harry? Dorian Gray falls in love with an attractive girl who plays Juliet. Why not? If he married Messalina, he would be nonetheless interesting. <laughs> the problem with marriage is that it makes one unselfish, and unselfish people are dull people. I hope, Basil, that Dorian will make this girl his wife, be fascinated by her for, say, six months, and then passionately adore someone else. You don't mean a single word of that. You're much better than you pretend to be. Well, the reason we like to think so well of others is that we're all afraid of ourselves. The basis of optimism is sheer terror. Rubbish. You want to mar nature? Reform it. So, we see her tonight in some disreputable theatre in the East End. The boy is late. As usual. <laughs> The theatre's fat manager met us at the door, beaming an oily, tremulous smile. It was as if we had come to meet Miranda and found Caliban. The house was crowded that night. The heat was oppressive and the sunlight flamed like a monstrous dahlia with petals of yellow fire. Beneath us in the pit, youths lounged and yawned and shared their oranges with the tawdry girls who sat beside them. What a place to find one's divinity! <laughs> You may smile, Harry. You may even mock the idea of my loving this girl. She trusts me implicitly. Her touch changes me. A look from her changes me. Those fascinating, delightful, poisonous theories of yours, they're all wrong. She is divine. You shall see. And when she first stepped onto the stage, she did indeed look divine. She drew gasps of admiration even from the beasts swarming in the pit. Dorian gazed at her, motionless. Charming. Charming. She is delightful, Dorian. Quite delightful. These common, coarse people become quite different when she is on stage. They sit silently and watch her. They weep, they laugh as she wills them. One feels they are of the same flesh and blood as oneself. As oneself? Oh, I do hope not. Form. Fain, fain deny what I have spoke. But farewell, compliment. Dost thou love me? I we watched this divine love. creature as she played the scene. We heard a voice artificial in tone and strained in delivery. We saw mechanical gestures and unconsidered movements. Basil and I watched our dear friend while he watched the object of his love. And we pitied him. All about the house, the audience grew restive, yet Dorian stared unseeing at the puppet on the stage below. Poor Dorian. Fair Montague, I am too fond, and therefore thou may think my hate your life. Dorian's face grew pale as he watched her. 
Her acting was absurdly superficial. She overemphasized everything. Beautiful passages of verse were declaimed with the painful precision of a schoolgirl. She moved listlessly and without purpose about the stage. She was a complete failure, as everyone, even Dorian, could recognize. She is beautiful, Dorian, but she cannot act. Let us go. I will see the play through. I'm awfully sorry that I've made you waste an evening, Harry. I apologize to you both. My dear Dorian, I should think Miss Vane was ill. We will come some other night. I wish it were illness. But she is cold, entirely changed. Last evening, she was a great artist. Now she is commonplace. Mediocre. Dorian, come with us. No need to grieve. You wouldn't want your wife to act, after all. So what does it matter if she plays Juliet like a wooden doll? She's very lovely. And if she knows as little about life as she does about acting, she will be a delightful experience. Go away. Please. Just go. We left the boy to his grief before the play had ended. Dorian. Oh, my dear, how badly I acted tonight. It was dreadful. You have no idea how I have suffered. But surely you understand. You do understand. Understand what? Before... Before I knew you, acting was the one reality of my life. One night I lived Portia, the next Rosalind. Beatrice's joy was my joy, the sorrows of Cordelia were mine also. I knew nothing but shadows. And I thought them real. <laughs> Then you came, my love, and taught me what reality was. No. I saw tonight how shallow it all was. Dearest Dorian, I cannot play at being in love when I know what it truly is. You have killed my love. Dorian? No. You stirred my imagination. Now you don't even stir my curiosity. I loved you because you were marvellous, a genius because you gave shape and substance to the shadows of art. Tonight I see you for the shallow, stupid girl you are. A third-rate actress with a pretty face. Dorian, please, please! Don't touch me. I wish I'd never laid eyes on you. What can you know of love if you said Mars your art? Without your art, you are nothing. You're not serious, Dorian. You're acting. I leave the acting to you. You do it so well. Don't leave me. Say you love me. Don't leave me alone. I don't wish to be unkind, but I can't see you again. <gasps> you have disappointed me. <gasps> oh. I don't remember where I went after leaving her. Dimly lit streets, gaunt, black shadowed archways, evil looking tenements. Drunks reeled by and women huddled over low fires near seeping walls. Children lay in grotesque bundles in doorways. As dawn came, I found myself near Covent Garden. The market was waking. Huge carts rumbled slowly down the polished streets. The air was heavy with the perfume of flowers. Jerry's, have some on me, mate. Porters lay asleep on piles of sacking. Iris-necked pigeons ran about picking up seeds. I hailed a cab and returned home. The sky was pure pearl. Thin smoke rose from the chimneys opposite. I turned off the jets burning in the Venetian lantern that hung in the hall, threw my hat and cape on the table, and passed through the library towards the door of my bedroom. The portrait Basil had painted stood beside the bedroom door. Light seeped on the painting through the red velvet curtains. I glanced at it dismissively, then... Then something drew me back. I looked at it again in the full early morning light. I saw then what I'd half expected to see in my own mirror. 
It was changed, not I. So small a change, and yet I saw it. There were lines where once my skin had been smooth, lines about the mouth and eyes, and then, then I remembered what I had said those weeks ago when it was finished. How there was nothing, there is nothing, nothing, nothing in the world that I would not give to remain as I am, and for the picture to grow old. I would give my soul for that. My soul. No. Dear God. No. No. I searched then for a hand mirror and looked again at my own face, smooth. Untroubled, unlined. Yet in the image Basil had made, the set of lines about the mouth were tight, cruel. It wasn't possible, and yet, yet, had I been cruel to Sybil? If so, it was no great matter. Women are better able to bear sorrow than men. She was nothing to me now, nothing. Yet the picture. It seemed to hold the secret of my life. I'd dared to love my own beauty. I admit as much. Would it teach me to loathe my own soul? It's the light. I'm tired. Nothing's changed. Nothing. I'll go and see the girl. Make amends. Yes. Give up Harry and his poisonous little theories. That's what I'll do tomorrow. But first, sleep. And cover the picture. Up early, hide it. It's nothing but a trick of the light. I'm so tired. Dorian, I insist on seeing you. Go away, Harry. Go away. I'm writing a letter to you. I left instructions. A letter. I've quite decided never to see you again. Dorian, I'm very sorry for it all, but you must not blame yourself. You saw her, didn't you, last night, after the play was over? Sybil. Yes, I felt sure you had. Did you make a scene with her? I was perfectly brutal, Harry, but it's all right now. It has taught me to know myself better. I'm so glad you take it that way. I was afraid I'd find you plunged in remorse. I'm through all that. I now know what conscience is. It's not what you tell me. It's the divine in us. I want to be good. I can't bear the idea of my soul being hideous. A charming artistic basis for ethics, Dorian. I congratulate you on it. And how do you propose to begin? By marrying Sybil Vane. But, my dear Dorian... She used to be my wife. But didn't you get my letter? I sent it over by my own man. I have not read it yet. I didn't want to. You cut life to pieces with your epigrams. You know nothing, then? Nothing? Dorian, don't be frightened. My letter was to tell you that Sybil Vane is dead. It's not true. It's a lie. How dare you say that? It is quite true, Dorian. It's in all the morning papers. There will be an inquest, of course. You must not be mixed up in it. Things like that make a man fashionable in Paris, but in London people are so prejudiced. What happened? Tell me what happened. They say she... she swallowed something. A mistake, of course. Something they use in theatres, prussic acid or white lead. or Just very quick. Prussic acid, I should think. Hurry. Dear God. Yes. Yes, of course, it's very tragic. According to the standard, she was 17. She looked younger than that. She knew so little about acting. <sighs> Come with me to the opera tonight. Everybody will be there. I have murdered Sybil Vane. What shall I do? There is nothing you can do. Ignore it. You have no idea of the danger I'm in, Harry. There is nothing to keep me straight. She would have done that for me. If you married this girl, you would have been wretched. The only way a woman reforms a man is by boring him so much that he loses all interest in her. The whole thing would have been an absolute failure. Why is it that I can't feel this tragedy as much as I want to? What has really happened, Dorian? Someone has killed herself for love of you. I wish that I had ever had such an experience. It would have made me in love with love for the rest of my life. She had no right to kill herself. It was selfish of her. 
I assure you, Dorian, most women console themselves for a lost love without dying for it. Some wear sentimental colours. Never trust a woman who is fond of pink ribbons. <laughs> <laughs> others fling their conjugal felicity in your face, yet others turn to religion. You know, nothing makes one so vain as being told one is a sinner. <laughs> Sybil Vane chose another, more surprising way. That's all. I was terribly cruel to her. Women appreciate cruelty more than anything. They have wonderfully primitive instincts. Dorian, don't waste tears on Sybil Vane. She was less real than the part she played. Harry, you have explained me to myself. You said something I felt but was afraid to say. We won't talk of it again. It has been a most marvellous experience. That's all? That's all. I wonder if life still has in store anything as wonderful. There is nothing that you, with your extraordinary good looks, will not be able to do. Suppose I become haggard and old and wrinkled. Uh, then you would have to fight for your victories. <laughs> now, dress and we'll drive down to the club. I think I shall join you at the opera. I feel too tired to eat anything. You've been such a friend to me, Harry. Thank you. Our friendship is only beginning. At nine, then. My sister's box on the grand tier. My dear Good evening, Divine. Quite divine. My dear Dorian. My dear Dorian. Much obliged to see you, Dorian. My dear Good evening, Dorian. So the choice is made. Poor Sybil Vane. To have mimicked death so often on the stage and then to have played that dreadful last scene. To free young Dorian. My life is decided. Eternal youth. The picture does that for me. I have only to look in the mirror to see it's true. No lines, no cruel cast of the mouth or the eyes. I'm truly free. Infinite passion. Pleasures subtle and secret, wild joys and wilder sins. I can have all those and there will be no change. I shall kiss the lips of the portrait and thank it for bearing the burden of whatever shame might burden me. <laughs> it will be a mirror of my life. I was disappointed not to find you at home last night, Dorian. Someone said you were seen at the opera. <laughs> I gave the lie to that, of course. But Basil, I was there. Harry's sister, Lady Gwendolyn, was there too. Perfectly charming she is. You went to the opera? And the woman you loved still lying in some sordid lodgings? You, you talk of other women being charming and the girl not yet in the quiet of her grave. Do stop it, Basil. Stop. What's past is past. But you called yesterday the past. Time has nothing to do with it. A man who can master himself can end a sorrow as easily as he can invent a pleasure. I don't want to be at the mercy of my emotions. I want to use them, enjoy them, dominate them. That's horrible. You talk as if you had no heart, no pity in you. It is all Harry's influence, I see that. I owe a great deal to Harry. More than I owe to you. You only taught me to be vain. Now, what do you want? The Dorian Gray I used to paint. Good heavens, man. Sybil Vane has just killed herself. Indeed so. At least it wasn't a vulgar accident. Her death has all the pathetic senselessness of martyrdom. I suffered immensely. Then it passed away. You came to console me and feel angry because I don't need your consolation. I came to comfort you. 
I won't mention it again, if you'd rather. But your name will be dragged into it. The inquest. The mother. <laughs> she only ever knew my Christian name. I must commission you to make a drawing of Sybil. I should like something of her more than the memory of a few kisses and some pathetic words. I will try to do something. If you will come and sit for me, please. I can't get on without I you. I can never sit for you again, Basil. Impossible. But why? Don't you like the portrait? It's my best work. Where is it? Have you put it in another room? I was sure it was in here. Is it behind the screen? Don't. If you move that screen, if you look at that portrait again, I swear our friendship is over. Everything will be finished between us. But I want to exhibit the picture in Paris. I will not allow it. No one shall see the picture. But Dorian... Never! Say at least that you will sit for me again. Impossible. I can't explain it to you, Basil. There is something fatal about your picture. It has a life of its own. Life of I will come and have tea with you, that I can promise. But you must never ask me to sit again, nor to see the portrait. He rang, sir. Did the housekeeper do as I asked and give you the key to the old schoolroom? It's no use, sir. The attic room at the top of the house. I know where my old schoolroom is. Be good enough to bring me the key. Don't, don't look at me so. Get out, get the key. I have the key, sir. And be kind enough to take this picture and to follow me with it. Mrs. Leaf said she wished to clear out the schoolroom before you went into it. She was sure it would be full of dust and cobwebs and old lumber, sir. Which I expect and want. Can you carry it alone? Yes, sir. It's heavy, but... Come on, then. Mind the corner. Can you manage? Yes, sir. Be careful. Very careful. All right. Yes, sir. Careful. Good. In with it, then. Is there enough light? Yes, sir. In the corner, sir. Yes. Yes, there in the dark corner. Safe resting place. Keep it covered. It, leave me. Yes, sir. Did you see the notice in the St. James this evening? I don't believe I did. The inquest. Sybil Vane. Death by misadventure, it seems. Her mother was much affected. And I have no wish to be hurry. None whatsoever. I spent the afternoon reading that book you sent me. I was fascinated. More wine? I thought you'd like it. I didn't say I like it, Harry. I said it fascinated me. Oh, so you've discovered the difference. I'm so pleased. Venetian shore will cover it. One more look. One more. God, it changes even as I... What the worm is to the corpse, my sins will be to this painted image. They may defile it. They may make it shameful. But nobody will suspect. Nobody will know. 
We have to take our moment to live as we want to live. Look once more, then be done. See the gold hair, the curls, the blue eyes, the red lips. They seem slightly, slightly twisted. Cooler than before. Are they? Are they? In the first part of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, dramatised for radio by Nick McCarty, Jamie Glover played Dorian Gray, Ian McDermott, Lord Henry Wooten, and Stephen Pacey, Basil. Sybil was played by Tilly Gaunt, Jim, Harry Myers, Mrs Vane, Elizabeth Mansfield, Lord Fermor, Brett Usher, Aunt Agatha, Mary Wimbush, the theatre manager, Gavin Muir, Lady Wooten, Elizabeth Bell, Lady Narborough, Tessa Worsley, and the servant, Tom George. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Original music was composed and played by David Chilton. The pianist was Simon Moorcroft. The picture of Dorian Gray was directed by Gordon House. The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. Dramatised for radio by Nick McCarty. With Jamie Glover as Dorian Gray and Ian McDermott as Lord Henry Wooten. When Dorian discarded his little actress, I gave him a book. In this book, our hero, a young Parisian, abandons himself to a life of sensual pleasure. There is, alas, a price to be paid. As our hero ages, his beauty withers, to the point where he cannot bear to see his reflection in the glass. But Dorian paid no such price. He remained as beautiful as the day when Basil painted his portrait. I heard Gray was in Paris last month. And that dancer tried to kill herself. Mm. In Berlin, there was talk of a girl with acid in her face. <sighs> Did you ever see the young men in dancer's place? They say Gray has been they seen... They say what? Who say what, sir? Nothing, Gray. Nothing. Damn you and your friends. At least I know how to live. And devil take the consequences for others. Should the devil so wish? <laughs> Henry, I'll see you in your sister's box this evening. Dorian. How does he escape the effects of his debauchery, Lord Henry? We all know him for what he is, and yet... Perhaps you know nothing. We know a young man hanged himself but weeks ago and his sister was sent away to a private home for the insane. He was the cause. And we all know it. Of course it was. He was accused by their father and he laughed in the old man's face. If they only knew. If they could see what I see at home each night. Knowing what I know, what I am. Each day I vow I'll not look again at the picture dear Basil painted so long ago. But I can't resist it. It's a drug. I have the keys to the room. I alone can visit it. The screen under the old curtain I see my inner self see the face bloated and blotched with wine 
the eyes dead, the mouth thick-lipped, the teeth rotting in the gums. The picture grows old, decays, while I stay young, young, beautiful, innocent. <laughs> Come to my soiree. Good, I resist. Don't you always attract the best of society and the most sublime of pianists? Who is the girl? I heard her play in Paris last month. I thought you'd enjoy her, as I do. Have a care, Dorian. People are talking. Talking? About you and Lord Rochborough's daughter. She was found in their lake, drowned. But you knew this, of course. She was such a delicious temptation, my friend. Such a waste. Have a care. I care nothing for what the gossips say. Nor society. Men should live as I do, for their senses alone. The young gather at his feet to worship him, Basil. He's more than twenty years their senior in age, a hundred in experience. Yet I defy you to tell it. He looks exactly as he looked when I painted his portrait. Impossible, of course, but true. Are the stories true? He debauches himself and whomever he touches. Not me, my friend. Nor you. I hardly see him now. Not since the portrait. Since you took him away. I regret that. I've never painted as well, as truthfully. He lives for the gratification of the senses, Basil. A sensuous life that corrodes most seems to revitalize him. Were you at the costume ball when he came as Anne de Joyeuse in a dress covered with 560 pearls? I was not. What a subject it would have made. If he'd allowed me to paint him, which I doubt. Oh? Does he ever show you the portrait? His portrait? I asked him once and he flew into such a temper I have never dared ask since. I haven't seen it for years. I followed him once into the stews of London, to the doors of vile women, degraded boys. He walked in, greeting them each by name, laughing, touching. I was revolted by it. Even you? <laughs> Even me. He gave up the villa we shared in Trouville, he said something about wanting to be in the same place as his portrait. He rushed home only a month ago from a party in Northamptonshire. Where is he now, Harry? Who knows? Gone away again. Men hate him, you know, sneer at him. Are afraid of him. Yet his wealth is his security. Society, civilised society at least, is never very ready to believe anything to the detriment of those who are both rich and fascinating. Manners are of more importance than morals. Respectability is of much less value than the possession of a good chef. <laughs> You're incorrigible. <laughs> One does one's best. <laughs> it's as if some poison is infecting him. Poison comes to a man in many ways, Basil. Think of the Renaissance. You could be poisoned by an embroidered glove, a jeweled fan, a gilded pomander, an amber chain. A book. Book. Evil Basil may simply be a mode through which to realize beauty. And I shall pray for him. And for you. Thank you. Good night. Dorian! What extraordinary luck. Basil, I've been waiting for you in your library since nine o'clock. I particularly wanted to see you. So now you see me, swirled about in this damn fog. I go to Paris by the midnight train. I had to visit you before I left. I believe my house is about here somewhere. 
Stand if I can be sure. I haven't seen you in ages. You'll be back soon? Maybe six months, maybe more. I'm taking a studio there, a new project, you know, something rather big. But it wasn't about myself I wanted to talk. And as you're here, you'd better come in. But won't you miss your train? I have heaps of time. I sent all my heavy things. All I have is this small bag. What a way for a fashionable painter to travel. A Gladstone bag and an Ulster. <laughs> come in or the fog will creep into the house. Right. And no talk about anything serious. Nothing is serious nowadays. At least nothing should be. Harry said he'd seen you last week. He never mentioned your leaving for Paris. No one knows. Not even my servants. I prefer to keep my privacy. Mm, wise man. Hawk and seltzer or whiskey? No, thank you. I want to speak to you most seriously. Don't frown like that. I asked you not to be serious, Basil. Whatever it is, let it not be about myself. I'm tired of myself tonight. It is about you. No. I shall only keep you half an hour. Half an hour? It's not much to ask, and it's for your own sake, Dorian. I think it right that you should know that the most dreadful things are being said about you. I love scandals about other people, but scandals about myself don't interest me. They've not got the charm of novelty. Dorian, people talk of you as something... something vile, degraded. I don't believe the rumours. Sin is a thing that writes itself across a man's face. There is no such thing as a secret vice. It shows. In the lines of the mouth, the droop of an eyelid. Basil, spare me all this. I paint faces and I know there is no sin in your face. Yet people whisper such things about you. Why? They have nothing else to do. The Duke of Berwick leaves his club when you enter. Indeed he does. Why will gentlemen in London neither go to your house nor invite you to theirs? Perhaps, Basil, they have no taste. I was at dinner with Lord Staveley and your name came into the conversation. He said that no pure-minded girl should be allowed to know you. No chaste woman should sit in the same room as you. I told him I was a friend and asked him what he meant by it. Really, Basil? Why? Why demean yourself? He told me the most appalling story about you. It was his cousin's fault. What could I do? You could deny it. Lie? Why is your friendship so fatal to young men? Why indeed? That wretched boy in the guards who committed suicide. You were his friend. Henry Ashton, who had to leave England. Lord Kent's only son. I met his father in St James's Street. He seemed broken with shame and sorrow. Basil, what do you know about these things? Berwick leaves the room because I know about him. Everything. Ashton and the young Perth. Did I teach one his vices and the other one his debauchery? And if Kent's silly son takes his wife from the streets, what is it to me? Henry Wooten and you are inseparable, and yet you have made his sister's name a byword. <laughs> Take care, Basil. Lady Gwendolen was never touched by a breath of scandal. Is there a single decent woman in London who would drive with her now in the park? Even her children are not allowed to live with her. You go too far, sir. You have been seen slinking out of dreadful houses, disgusting dens in every rookery in London. Do you deny it? Don't preach at me, sir. My oldest friend, Lord Gloucester, had a letter from his wife, dying in her villa at Monton. Your name was implicated in the most terrible confession I have ever heard. <laughs> she is dying, sir, and you smile and shrug. Yet I know you as a thoroughly decent man. Did I know you? Do I know you? I should have to see your soul to answer that. See my soul? Only God can do that. You shall see it, Basil. You shall. You chatter about corruption. <gasps> come and see it face to face. <gasps> come with me, sir. Bring the lamp and come. Last for me. Don't say such things. <laughs> At least deny these charges made against you. Don't tell me you're corrupt, debauched. Dorian. 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 Don't touch me. Don't touch me. Now, you want to read my soul, Basil? You won't have to wait long. What's this room? My old nursery. A room never used, saved by me. I come here to feast my eyes on my soul. What? What do you mean? You insisted. And I shall show you. After all, Basil, you are the one man in the world entitled to know everything about me. Draw that curtain back. 
and look at my soul. My God, no picture of me. No! The beautiful, innocent, blooming youth. See the eyes, sodden, the nose no longer chiseled and fine, but bloated with drink, the hands knotted, clawed. See behind the eyes, darkness. My soul, Basil, my soul. Oh, God, what does it mean? When I was a boy, while you were painting that picture, you introduced me to a friend of yours who explained to me the wonder of youth. And when you finished that portrait, it revealed to me the wonder of beauty. In a mad moment, <laughs> I don't know whether I regret it or not, I made a wish, a prayer, that I would stay young and you'd grow old. I remember it, I remember it well, but that's... That's impossible. You told me you have destroyed it. It has destroyed me! It's not my picture, it's not mine. I disown it. Your name is on it. How I hate you for this. It was the face of an angel. And now it is the face of a satyr. A soul in hell. To have done this with your life. You must be worse than even those who talk against you fancy you to be. This is leprous evil. Can you see your ideal in it? My ideal? As you called it. Pray. Dorian, on your knees and pray with me for your repentance. You will be forgiven if only you ask. The prayer of your pride has been answered. The prayer of your repentance will be answered also. Though your sins be as scarlet, yet I will make them as white as snow. It means nothing to me, Basil. Sheer <laughs> sentimentality. Don't say that. Haven't you done enough evil in your life? Every night, I come home and see another line. Another vein, another bloated lump of flesh. I hate you for it, Basil. I hate you for it. Torian, I am your friend. I hate you. No, put that down. No. To kill no. you is nothing to what I have done. No, please. Please, no! 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 and go to hell! Good. Even here. More tea, sir? No, Francis, thank you. It's a lovely morning, sir. Will you be riding in the park? Take this note to Mr. Alan Campbell at 152 Hartford Street. If he's not there, find out where he is and take it on. It's important that he reaches him. Yes, sir. They'd been close. Good friends. Then something occurred. None of us knew what, but Alan Campbell never again stayed in a room in which Dorian held court. Their break was absolute. Alan would turn pale at the mention of his name. Mr. Campbell, sir. Thank you, Francis. 
Show him in at once. Then go to Richmond and collect an order of blue orchids. The usual man. Take the day off. I have no need of you, and the river is looking lovely. Thank you, sir. Mr. Campbell, sir. Thank you for coming, Alan. It's kind of you. I had intended never to enter your house again. Sit down, please, sit down. I still don't really know why I've come. I swore never again to speak to you, Dorian. Never. Alan, in a locked room at the top of this house, a room to which nobody but myself has access, a dead man is lying on the floor. Dead? He's been dead ten hours now. I want nothing to do with Who this. the man is or why he died, how he died, are matters that do not concern you. What you have Don't to do is... Don't you listen? I entirely decline to be mixed up in your life. Keep your horrible secrets to yourself. I'm not interested. Alan, I'm awfully sorry, but this will have to interest you. I can't help myself in the matter. I need your skills. And I have no option. You know about chemistry and things of that kind. You've made experiments. What you have to do is destroy that thing upstairs. No. There's no risk. He is, as far as anyone knows, in Paris for months. Nobody saw him come to my house. You must change him into a handful of ashes that I may scatter in the air. You're mad. Would I lift a finger to help you? Or peril my reputation again for you? Ask your friend Lord Henry Wooden to help. Nothing will induce me to stir a step to help you. You've come to the wrong man. Alan, it was murder. I killed him. Good God. You don't know what he's made me suffer. Murder? I'll do nothing for you. If you found this man on some dissecting room block, he wouldn't turn a hair. You're used to such work, Alan. His body is the only piece of evidence against me. If it is discovered, I am lost. Help me, please. I beg you, we were friends once. Well, those days are dead. I'll hang for this. I entreat you. Then hang. I'll do nothing. I'm so sorry for you, Alan, but you leave me no alternative. Read this note. Before you do, you should know that I have a letter written that I will post. See the address? You are going to help me. Read it, Alan. I tried to spare you, but you've been offensive. And no living man has ever treated me as you have. So it is for me to dictate the terms. I can't do it. I can't. You have no choice. Is there a fire in the room upstairs? Yes. A gas fire. I shall have to go home to get some things. No, you will write a list. We will send for them. To have gone from corruption to murder, as you have done. To force me to do what I am to do. You disgust me. Oh, Alan. I wish you had a thousandth part of the pity for me that I have for you. Careful with the box. There's glass and chemicals inside. Take care. Alan, don't be afraid. There's no one left in the house. My man has gone to Richmond to find my orchid grower. No one else is at home. How long will it take? I don't know. A few hours. Five hours with luck. I don't know. It's in here. I light the lamps on the fire. Leave me. You give me the key and leave me. You saved me from ruin, Alan. I shall never forget that. Leave me now. To see him slink into that room, to sit downstairs in my library and read as he went about his work with the corpse, to see the terror in his eyes as he gave me the key to the empty room, to watch my old friend walk broken into the square, 
was curiously exhilarating. Henry! How good of you to come. And how kind of you to introduce your son-in-law. <laughs> Dorian, how are you? You look a little out of sorts. I believe he is in love. He is afraid to tell me for fear I will be jealous. Dear Lady Narborough, I have not been in love for a whole week. Not, in fact, since Madame de Ferrol left town. Now, there's a woman with an astonishing capacity for family affection. When her third husband died, her hair turned quite gold from grief. <laughs> How can you, Harry? <laughs> is Ferrol her fault? Certainly. I don't believe it. Ask Mr. Gray. He is an intimate friend. It's true. I asked her whether, like Marguerite de Navarre, she had their hearts embalmed and hung at her girdle. Uh, she told me she didn't, because none of them had any hearts at all. <laughs> <laughs> Four husbands. Upon my word, that's a trop d'audace, uh, Trop d'audace, I tell her. What is Sarah like? The husbands of beautiful women belong to the criminal classes. That's enough, Lord Henry. You are, as the world says, extremely wicked. Monstrous the way people go about saying things behind one's back that are absolutely and entirely true. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, excuse me. Mrs. Ernie, how lovely you're looking. Dorian, you ran off early last night. Did you go straight home? No, Harry. I didn't get home until nearly two. No, no, it, it was three. Maybe. Did you go on to the club? Yes. No, I, I, I walked about. I, I forget what I did. How inquisitive you are, Harry. I remember now. I, I arrived home at quarter past two. You may ask the policeman on the Grosvenor Square beat if you want. He saw off a drunk whore. The church clock My struck a quarter. My dear fellow, as if I cared. What's happened, Dorian? You are not yourself. Don't mind me. Irritable and out of temper. We'll talk tomorrow or the next day. Will you make my excuses to Lady Narborough? I don't feel too well. Can I come with you? No. I can't deprive Lady Narborough of her favourite guest. I go home, and there is no one here. I feel so restless. I must have the Florentine cabinet moved. The light quite misses the inlay. Open it. Yes. Where is it? find suitable company and a pipe and dreams. See that girl in the shadows? I had her when she was a child. See her now, huddled against that weeping wall. What was it Henry said? Cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by means of the soul. Well, the soul can rot. Here we are. Here. Here. Won't you step here, Gov? It's a leery place. Go. friend come to chase the dragon <laughs> come along with me I've got a nice palette and decent company not as you'll be much bothered about the company when you've the pipe going I know the way mind the gutter it's overflowing dawn you're right push it it's open mister here <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, darling. Come into the light. Let's see you. Oh, it's you. I told you never to come back. Who's here? A few friends. Don't you get nasty with me. And a sailor in the back, just drinking. He should know better. We pick clean by morning. Your friend is up the stairs. He took a pipe in case you came along. I said Prince Charming's not welcome again. I said after last time I had no wish to see him again. Tell my friend he can rot in hell. I'll go up the wharf and disappoint him. I have no wish for company. <sighs> Who was that? Uh, uh, the devil's bargain, I call him sailor. You want a pipe, sailor boy? You had a name for him. What was it? The devil's bargain. Sometimes Prince Charming, he likes that. It reminds him of a girl, he says, and he laughs. What girl? <laughs> Who does he say? Tell me or I'll break your arm. Oh, leave me be, bastard. I'll have you blinded before you can say no. Leave me be. I'll slice your throat. His name. Oh, don't dare tell you his name. Oh, my life, I don't. Put that shiv away. Put it away. That's a good boy. Where are you going? Prince Charming and me have got an appointment. Don't go. Not after him, friend. Not if you value your soul. Hold still. What the... Who the devil... Hold still or I'll snuff you out soon as spit. What do you want? Prince Charming. <laughs> you remember a girl who called you that and you laughed? In that opium hell, you talk about my dear dead sister and laugh, surrounded by whores. Make your peace with God, for tonight you're gonna die. No! Her name was Sybil Vane. She killed herself because of you. I swore I'd kill you in return. You're mad. You don't deny it. I've searched for you for years. No clue, no trace. Just the pet name she used to call you. I heard it tonight. And you're gonna die. No, I never knew her. Never heard of her. Get on your knees and pray. I'll go abroad for India tonight, but first I'll do this job. One minute. How long ago is it since your sister died? Quick, tell me. Eighteen years. What do years matter? Eighteen years? Set me under the lamp and look at my face. Do I look cruel enough? Wicked enough? Old enough to have killed your sister? Look at my face. Look at me! My God! And I would have murdered you. You see? So near to committing a terrible, terrible crime. Oh, forgive me, Sarah. I was deceived. I meant a chance word. Let that I... be a lesson to you. Now leave me be. Dear God. You fool! What? You had him! What Why you didn't you do him in bad and bad and bad? But, but he's too young. He, he'd have been little more than a boy 18 years back. You think so? Prince Charming made me what I am 18 years back. What? Believe me, he's the worst that comes into these stews. They say he sold himself to the devil for a pretty face. He hasn't changed in all them years. I have. That's impossible. Don't ever tell him I told you. Don't tell. I'm afraid of him. Get the chance again. Kill him for my sake. For your sister who sent to her death. He talked of it in opium dreams and laughed. I've heard him. Who got him to hell? I'll find him. His name? Prince Charming, the devil's spawn. You want a pretty little girl. I can be a His pretty little name, girl. His damn you! you. Dorian Gray. <laughs> Dorian was sitting with us in the conservatory of his Northamptonshire home on the first evening of a hunting weekend. Young men in elaborate smoking costumes handed tea cakes to the women. Dorian sat close to the young, pretty Duchess of Monmouth. Her husband, a jaded-looking man of sixty, talked to Lady Narborough about the Brazilian beetle he had just pinned into his collection. The mellow light of the huge lace-covered lamp lit up the delicate china, the hammered silver of the service, and the Duchess's white hands and full red lips. 
I hope Gorin has told you of my plan to rechristen everything Gladys, Gladys. Oh, Harry. <laughs> well, I was thinking chiefly of flowers. Uh, yesterday, I cut an orchid from my buttonhole. In a thoughtless moment, I asked one of the gardeners its name. Robinson Yana, or something dreadful. <laughs> Robinson Yana. It's a sad truth, Gladys, <laughs> but we have lost the faculty of giving lovely names to things. Names are everything. That is the reason I hate vulgar realism in literature. The man who would call a spade a spade should be compelled to use one. It is the only thing he is fit for. Let's talk of someone else. Our host is a delightful topic. Years ago, he was christened Prince Charming. Stop that, Harry. It was a long time ago, after all. It is not good for my reputation. Your reputations, like hats, are best made out of nothing, Gladys. To be popular, be a mediocrity. Oh, no. Women rule the world and can't bear mediocrities. We love with our ears as you men love with your eyes, if you ever love at all. It seems to me we never do anything else. Then you never really love, Mr. Gray. My dear Gladys, how can you say that? Each time one loves is the only time one has ever loved. We can have in this life but one great experience at best. And the secret of life is to reproduce it as often as possible. Even when one has been wounded by it? Especially when one has been wounded by it. All I search for is peace. And if I do not go up to dress, I shall have none this evening. Now allow me to get you some orchids from the end of the conservatory. A moment. You are flirting disgracefully with him. Take care, for he is very fascinating. If he were not, there would be no battle. Greek meets Greek, then? I'm on the side of the Trojans. They fought for a woman. And were defeated. Ah! Dorian had leaned close to the curved windows of the conservatory to clip a prize bloom, and then fainted. He was carried to the blue drawing room and laid on the sofa. Did anyone see what happened? Uh, he was uh, he was cutting a blue orchid and looked up. There seemed to be a white face pressed against the glass. It was a curious effect. Then he cried out and fainted. What did he cry out? I'm not sure. Something about Prince Charming. Dorian walked alone with the Duchess in the garden the next morning. A crisp frost lay across the lawn like salt. He seemed withdrawn when we met over the breakfast table. I'm afraid I'm out of sorts, Harry. It's the thought of shooting those poor innocent birds. I leave that to the others. They seem to be excited at the prospect. Killing is such merry sport. Do you think a murderer feels the same delight as a country sportsman? Harry, stop. Please. My dear chap, you're quite pale. Did you sleep badly? I had something of a shock yesterday. Do you wish to talk about it? Denby said he saw someone looking into the conservatory just before you fainted. No, absolutely not so. I think I'll take some air after all. If you'll excuse me, you'll find those volumes I mentioned in the library. Hmm? Enjoy them, Harry. Uh, Have a left there. There. Oh, good morning, my boy. No gun today? No, Geoffrey. Have you had good sport? Oh, I think most of the birds have gone to the open. I dare say it'll be better after lunch. I had chosen to walk instead of visiting the library. I was beyond the spinney, well away from the beaters and guns. The keen, aromatic air, the cries of the beaters, the sharp snap of guns fascinated me. Looking across the glade, I saw Dorian smiling and laughing with beaters and hunters alike. He seemed delightfully at ease with himself, dominated by the high indifference of joy. Suddenly, a hare with black-tipped ears erect bolted from a thicket. Geoffrey put his gun to his shoulder. Dorian cried out to him not to shoot. Geoffrey shot. Oh, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Get him. Get him. I've hit a beater. What an ass he is to get in front of the guns. Stop shooting her! Stop shooting, keeper! Sir, sir, you are, sir! Oh, damn it! A man is. 
Why the devil can't you keep him out of the line of fire? Uh, he's not one of ours, sir. I walked down to the line of guns as two beaters went into the thicket and retrieved the bloody form which had taken the full charge in its chest. Dorian, I'd better tell them the shooting stopped for the day. It would not look well to go on. Is the man dead? Yes, sir. Damn it, Gray, it looks bad to pepper a beater. The word gets out that a chap is reckless. It was the man's fault. Come along, Dorian. We'll walk home. It's a bad omen, Harry. It's as if something horrid was going to happen to us. To me, even. The only horrible thing in the world is ennui, Dorian. To be tedious is the one sin for which there is no forgiveness. And there is no such thing as an omen. Destiny does not send us heralds. She is too wise or cruel for that. Cruel, not wise. And here's the Duchess looking like Artemis. Good morning. I've heard all about it, my dear. And poor Geoffrey's terribly upset. I understand you asked him not to shoot the hare, Dorian. How curious. My nerves are dreadfully out of order. Please excuse me, I'll go and lie down. Do you love him very much? I wish I knew. Love always ends at the same point. Where's that? Disillusion. Disillusion was my debut in life. Well, well. Knowledge would be fatal. It is the uncertainty that charms one, Gladys. You would sacrifice anybody for the sake of an epigram, Harry. The world goes to the altar of its own accord. Sir? Are you awake, sir? Yes, Francis. What is it? Thornton, sir. The head gamekeeper is waiting. Uh, send him in. Sir. I'll see you now. All right. Uh, Mr. Gray? Thornton, is it about the unfortunate accident? Uh, yes, sir. The uh, thing is, sir, well, we don't know who the dead man is. Wasn't he one of your men? I never saw him before. Seems like the sailor, sir. A sailor? Yes, sir. Tattoos on both arms, that kind of thing. Was anything found on him? Anything that would tell his name? Some money, sir, uh, and a six-shooter. No name. A decent-looking man, sir. But rough. Where's the body? In an empty stable, sir. Folk here do say it's unlucky to have a corpse in the house. I'll go to the stables myself. Come with me. We, uh, we put him on planks, sir. One of the women laid him out as well as she could. He might be poor, but he'd a right to a decent laying out. She did well. Did she put the candle in the jar? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, and uh, found the kerchief to cover his face in his pocket, sir. So, there he lies. Poor bugger. Shall I remove the... No, no, leave me. Are well, you sure? It's not a... Pre Just leave me. Go. Sir. vein was buried in a pauper's grave and forgotten. In town, life went on. I played cards in the club. I didn't see Dorian for weeks after the accident. Ascot came and went and Dorian was not seen. Nor did we see him at the opera or the theatre. There was a real mystery to occupy the gossips in the salons and the clubs. You know Basil Hallwood well, Harry. I see him from time to time. He is not amusing, but he paints well. Have you heard from him recently? Basil's a secretive sort of chap. Seems odd, that's all. It's weeks since he's been seen. They say he went to Rome. My wife heard it was Paris. Dorian walked into the card room and looked about. He saw us and walked over to speak with hand outstretched. 
Harry, how good to see you. Dorian. If you'll excuse me, Lord Henry. Are you going my way, John? <laughs> good night, Harry. Good night, Harry. My apologies, Dorian. Come into the music room and play Schubert for me. It seems sad when I have quite decided to be good. You're quite perfect as it is. Why change? No, Harry. I've done too many dreadful things in my life. I'm not going to do any more. I began my good actions yesterday. The girl you were seeing in the country, the vicar's daughter, was she unwilling to be corrupted? She was beautiful. Quite beautiful. I spared her. <laughs> she was wonderfully like Sybil Vane. You remember the actress? How long ago that was? I remember her. Poor actress. Beautiful child. Hetty was so like her. Neither of our class, of course. But I loved her. And she was besotted by me. Yesterday she met me in an apple orchard. Blossoms kept tumbling on her hair and she was laughing. We were to have gone away together at dawn. But you spared her. I determined to leave her as I found her. Innocent as the day. I should think the novelty must have given you a thrill of real pleasure. You gave her good advice instead and broke her heart. Harry, you're horrible. She cried, of course, but she can live pure, unsullied. To be married to some dull plowman or a doctor's third son. Harry, stop mocking me. And don't try to persuade me that the first good action I've done for years is really a sort of sin. Now I shall play. Ah. You can tell me what is happening in town. People are still discussing Basil's disappearance. I should have thought people might be tired of that by now. Well, the British public is not equal to the mental strain of having more than one topic to discuss every three months. <laughs> they have been very fortunate lately. They've had my own divorce case and Alan Campbell's suicide. Alan Campbell? How? D did he leave a note? No. He was a friend of yours at one time, I believe. An acquaintance. No more. So what do you think has become of Basil? If he chooses to hide himself, it is no business of mine. If he is dead, I don't want to think about him. Death is the only thing that terrifies me. But I can survive everything nowadays except death and vulgarity. Don't people say he was murdered? Why should he have been murdered? He was not clever enough to have enemies. He was really rather dull. He only interested me once, when he told me years ago that he had a wild adoration for you and that you were the dominant motive of his art. I was fond of him. Basil had no curiosity. It was his chief defect. What would you say if I told you that I had murdered him? I would say, my dear fellow, that you were posing for a character that doesn't suit you. All crime is vulgar, just as all vulgarity is crime. Believe me, Harry. I'm sorry to hurt your vanity, but I assure you it is not true. It is not in you, Dorian, to commit murder. I saw a man in Hyde Park last Sunday. He had a little crowd of uncouth Christians about him. He asked them, what was it? What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What do you say to that? Why do you ask me that, Harry? I thought maybe you could give me an answer. Harry, the soul is a terrible reality. I know it is. No. Don't mock. There is a soul in each of us. Do you feel quite sure of that, Dorian? Quite sure. And then it must be an illusion. The things one feels absolutely certain about are never true. You are so wrong, Harry. How serious you are. Play me some Schubert. And while you play, tell me the secret of your youth. You've hardly changed in all the years I've known you. I am not the same. that thing you are playing is. What a blessing it is that there is one art left to us that is not imitative. You know, the tragedy of old age is not that one is old, but that one is young. How I wish I could change places with you. I'm glad you have never done anything, never produced anything outside of yourself. Life has been your art. 
Life has been exquisite. But I'm not going to have the same life, Harry. You don't know anything about me. If you did, even you would turn from me. Oh. Don't laugh. You and I will always be friends. You poisoned me with a book once. Never give that book to anyone. Promise me, it does harm. You are beginning to moralize, my dear boy. You're too delightful to do that. Art annihilates the desire to act. It is superbly sterile. The books that the world calls immoral are books that show the world its own shame. Come riding tomorrow. Or we can meet our little duchess. Oh, does she bore you already? I thought she might. Say eleven. The park is quite lovely now. The lilacs are exquisite. Very well. Eleven. Tomorrow. Good night, Harry. Good night, Dora. Harry. My dear. No matter. He walked away into the mist in the street below. I watched from a long window, saw him vanish into a swirl of yellow fog. It will change. I will change. I've already changed, not spoiling that girl's innocence, remembering only the sound of her laughter and a thrush in the orchard and the pale blossom in her hair. Her belief that wicked people are always very old and very ugly. Poor James Vane in a nameless grave. And Alan Campbell. Sybil Vane. God, how pretty she was. How lovely. Don't leave me. I love you so. Say you love me. Don't leave me alone. I want so much to become again. What I was. How can I when I corrupted myself and others and joyed in it? Good evening, sir. Francis, I shan't need you again tonight. I arrive at 11 tomorrow in the park. Very well, sir. The Hock and Seltzer is in the library as usual. Good night, sir. Good night. Cupids running round the rim of this mirror. How ironic. Harry gave it to me years ago. When I really was beautiful. The world is changed, my dear, because you are made of ivory and gold. The curve of your lips rewrites history. Damn this mirror. Damn this beauty which has stayed and marked nothing of time. Nothing can change what has gone. To have gone from corruption to murder as you have. To force me to do what I am to do. You disgust me. I pitied you, Alan. But I had no choice. And you took your own life. It was not of my doing. Why is your friendship so fatal to young men? What do I care for you, Basil? You made me what I am and deserve the knife in your throat. And if Ashton destroyed his father, what was it to me? Men do as they want. Women do as they are told. Do I care for them? I wonder if my first act of goodness, letting that country girl go without defiling her, does that show in the picture? changed it was the pinnacle of my work I loved him I would do anything to him dear God let me see one mark of goodness and change if every decent thing I do shows then one day I can wipe away the horror no corruption so vile as this this thing this <laughs> 
No. It's worse than before. There's blood on my hands. More blood. Glistening. Fresh. How can that be when I let that girl go untouched? I should think the novelty must have given you a thrill of real pleasure. Vanity? Was that all it was? That's not true! Vanity? Hypocrisy? To satisfy my own curiosity? No! The blood. It's still wet. Basil's blood. Must I live with his murder forever? Must I confess? Give myself up? <laughs> That awful face, those slug-like eyes, mean, vicious mouth, always there, showing myself to myself, exposing my soul. I'll destroy it. I'll destroy it! The knife that killed the painter. How appropriate to take up the knife again, to cut away this thing in the canvas that infects my life, to slash it to oblivion and free myself, kill this monstrous soul life and be at peace. Yes, yes. became numb and opened not my mouth for it was thy doing take thy plague away from me i have the portrait of dorian gray it's all he left me it's exquisite he is there as he was when basil painted him in the wonder of his youth and beauty in the attic room they found a man in evening dress with a knife in his heart he was withered wrinkled and loathsome to look at. It was not until they examined the rings on his bloated fingers that they recognized who it was. In the final part of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, dramatized for radio by Nick McCarty, Jamie Glover played Dorian Gray, Ian McDermid, Lord Henry Wooten, and Stephen Pacey, Basil. The Sailor was played by Harry Myers, Alan Campbell, Geoffrey Beavers, Lady Narborough, Tessa Worsley, The Duchess, Alice Arnold, and Thornton, Stephen Critchler. Francis was Tom George, the woman in the opium den, Elizabeth Bell, and the Duke, Brett Usher. Other parts were played by Gavin Muir, Tilly Gaunt, Edward D'Souza, and members of the cast. Music was composed and played by David Chilton. The pianist was Simon Moorcroft. The picture of Dorian Gray was directed by Gordon House. <laughs>